How can I know God exists? How can I know that God exists? Does God speak? Does God speak? What, makes what makes Christianity, Christianity unique? unique? How do I know if I'm going to heaven? Why wouldn't God, Why wouldn't save, God everyone? save everyone? How can anyone believe the Bible? Isn't it full of contradictions? Full of contradictions? Full of contradictions? Don't all religions lead to the same God? Why are there so, so many denominations? How can Christians claim Jesus is the only, the way? only way? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? How can you reconcile belief in God with science? How could a loving, loving God, God condemn people to hell? Do I need God to be what moral? What about all the hypocrites? All the... How could there be a God with so much evil and suffering? What about world? people who've never heard of Jesus? Jesus? Wasn't Jesus just a good teacher? Isn't it all relative? Isn't it all relative? Isn't it all, Isn't it all relative? relative? So today is an Ask Anything Sunday, and some of you have been around for this before. For some of you, it may be brand new, but the idea is that either via the worship guide or by texting in, you ask questions on the spot, and we do our best to answer them. And Pastor TJ uh, is funneling those questions down here. He he puts them on the screen, and so what we see, uh, well, it's not this. Eventually, he will tell us what the first question is, but he tries to keep us in suspense. Don't you like that? Uh, And so as we have the question, then somewhere in the midst of answering that first question, he'll put the next question on here and so on. We'll go back and forth with those questions. But the idea is that we we want to set the stage. We want to make it crystal clear that that the church is a place, Concordia is a place where questions are welcome, where people who have doubts aren't the outsider. People who have doubts are like everybody else. We, We struggle with things. We want to understand. But the reality is that instead of turning away because we have doubts and questions, we want to turn in. We want to go to the Bible and discover what it has to say. We want to think through the issues of the faith because I think that we are amazed when we begin to ask questions and look to what the Bible has to say, there are many more answers than we ever imagined. Now, one of the other things that I think is kind of neat is that we try very hard over the course of the morning not to answer the same question twice. And that's because when we're all done with this, Pastor TJ will go back in and he will divide out the question and the answers into individual segments, and then they'll be posted on a web page called Ask Anything, all one word, askanything.cc. In fact, he put together a little, a little video to show you how this works. So if you go to askanything.cc, you'll see this home screen, and you can click on any of those topics, or you can search up there in the search box, and you see that we're searching up the... Why did Jesus descend into hell? Question from the Apostles' Creed. And so you click on that, and you can actually watch the question and answer as it was posed during a worship service. Now, what's kind of neat is we've done this enough. There are over 100 questions and answers already posted, and all of the questions and answers from today will be posted there within the next couple of weeks. And so hopefully it's a a helpful resource that you can use, not just for the time that we spend together now, but at other times you can go and find those answers. Uh, But also know your questions are always welcome. You can always send those questions to the pastors here at Concordia, and we'll do our very best to give you an answer. So, Zach, are you ready? I think so. All right, first question. (laughs) Why do we say amen at the end of the prayer or creed? Okay, so uh, the word amen, it means uh, so be it, right? Uh, This is the way uh, that it should be. In fact, it's interesting, a lot of those uh, sayings in the Gospels where Jesus will say, truly, truly, I say unto you. Uh, the, The Greek word there is actually amen. So Jesus will say amen, amen. And so what is he saying? He's saying, let it be, let it be, right? This is the way that things ought to be. And so, when we say amen at the Apostles' Creed, uh, what do we say at the end of the Apostles' Creed? Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and the life everlasting. Anybody want to sign up for that? Life everlasting and resurrection of the dead and forgiveness? Let it be. Or, when we pray at the end of the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Anybody feel glad that God is in control, like when life feels out of control? We say, let it be. And so that's what the word amen means, and that's why we say it. It's a good answer, Zach. (laughs) Next question. Some say Christmas is too connected to pagan holidays and we shouldn't participate. What say you? 
let's begin with just a little bit of history, because there is this old historical myth out there that basically Christians ripped off Christmas uh, from the pagan Roman festival of the sun, okay, S-U-N. The winter solstice is December 21st, and so the Romans uh, used to celebrate this pagan festival of the sun on December 25th, because it was the first day that you could begin to see the sun coming back a little bit more. Now, here's the funny thing about that particular history. Uh, That festival of the sun, S-U-N, in uh, began with an emperor named Aurelian in uh, 274 AD. Christians were celebrating Christmas on December 25th, interestingly enough, from about the middle of the second century, which would put it at 150 AD. So which came first, Christmas, just historically, or the pagan festival of the sun? Well, Christmas just historically came first. And so there's a bit of mythology to say that Christians just ripped off old pagan holidays and turned it into Christmas. Uh, The festival of Christ's birth, uh, that goes way, way, way back. And Christians actually had some reasons to believe uh, that Jesus was born on December 25th, even though nobody can be quite sure of that. Now, of course, there are lots of things that go along with Christmas, trees and, and presents and all sorts of stuff. Sometimes we'll talk about this as the commercialization of, of, of Christmas. Here, here's the thing. Trees are created by God. Uh, gifts are given by God. And so you can either say, I want this to be a pagan celebration or a self-centered celebration, or you can say, these are wonderful things that are joyous and have deep Christian uh, symbolic meaning, and we can celebrate it like that. And so what Christmas is uh, for you depends on the faith that is in you. Well, first of all, kudos on the Roman history. That was pretty good. <laughs> but, but picking up on that last part, man, we live in freedom. We, we live as people who have been set free, not just from our sin and our shame and our guilt. We have been set free to live free lives. And so celebrate Christmas the way you want to celebrate Christmas, but keep Christ at the center. Live your faith and celebrate the things you want to celebrate in this life, but do so with, the, with Christ at the center. That's the freedom we have. Don't surrender that freedom. Don't become enslaved to some other practice or, or some other philosophy, but live out your freedom in the way you choose within the context of your faith. Christ at the center. Next question. According to Scripture, as children, what is our responsibility toward our aging parents? So, this can be a difficult question. Um, Many of you have probably been in situations where you may have a parent who requires a lot of care, and especially if you have kids of your own, it can get exhausting. And so, let's just start here. Uh, Thank you for for loving in very difficult situations, and uh, we're here for you, and we we care about you. And uh, if you can use prayer or something else, let us know. Uh, We're delighted to be there and give you all the encouragement and help that we can. Or talk through some of the complexities of this, because this is we're going to answer this in a few minutes. Yep. But this is a very broad question with lots of deviation points in individual lives. So uh, Jesus speaks to this in kind of a limited way, but I I at least want to walk through this. This is from Mark chapter seven, beginning at verse ten, and Jesus says that Moses said honor your father and your mother. But there were some religious leaders in Jesus' day who said, if a man tells his father or mother, uh, whatever you've gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, and you void the word of God uh, that has been handed down. And you do this kind of thing, Jesus says, all the time. Here, so here's, what does it mean? Yeah, here's what, what Jesus mean? is getting at. Uh, there were these gifts that were given called Corban gifts, and they were devoted to the temple. And sometimes, if a child really didn't like their father or their mother, they would take what they would have given to their father or their mother to help them out in their old age, to be there for them, to support them, and they would say, well, rather than giving this to you, I've given it to the Lord, and so I don't have anything left over for you. And really what it was was kind of this this false piety. It was a way of getting back at your father or your mother because you were angry at them and looking pious by giving stuff to God while being cruel to your parents. Now, here's the thing. Um, That, Jesus says, is out of bounds. This doesn't mean that sometimes it can't be difficult 
to care for an aging parent. This doesn't mean, especially if an aging parent is in the throes of some sort of, of some sort of disease state and you maybe hear things out of your mom or your dad that you never expected to hear. It doesn't mean that that isn't hurtful and that you don't need help with that. But Jesus does make it clear um, throughout your parents' whole lives, you shouldn't despise them. You should do your best, even when it's tough, to care for them. So to take that a step further, one of the things that, that's involved here is that sometimes we get confused because we, we want to be faithful. And so when it says, honor your father and your mother, it means that, that we do anything and everything that's required to, to help them, and we do that without boundaries. Dear friends, every aspect of our life requires boundaries. We've got to think things through and, and make sure that we're staying healthy in whatever we're doing, and the things that we're doing, we're doing for the right reason, with the right motivation. And, and so... That's where I mentioned before, this becomes difficult because there are all kinds of thorns and all kinds of sidetracks that can take place. And so if you need help thinking those through, if you need help thinking through the boundaries and understanding what, what your responsibility is, then seek some help. Certainly there are lots of counselors that can be of help to you, but if you want to talk to a pastor and think this through, we're available. Get in touch with us and we'll be glad, glad to think this through with you. Next question. Bethlehem was the ancestral home of Joseph. <laughs> Where was his family when he arrived and was unable to find a room? Speaking of taking care of your family, exactly right? Exactly the Joseph right Joseph got left out in the cold. Uh, so, uh, so two things to think about this. Number one, uh, it is true that Bethlehem was the ancestral, and that's actually a key word, home of Joseph. It does not mean that Joseph was necessarily born in Bethlehem. It simply means that Joseph was part of the household of David, and Bethlehem was the city of David. And so for this particular census, you went back to the place where your ancestors came from. So it could be that Joseph didn't have any uh, immediate relatives there. Uh, but the second thing uh, that, that you need to keep in mind is uh, for the census, remember, Bethlehem was, was bulging. There were lots of people there. And uh, we're not talking about inns. Pastor mentioned this in his Christmas Eve message that would have been in Bethlehem. Uh, we would have been talking about guest rooms. And so all the guest rooms in Bethlehem were full. And there's actually this really interesting theory uh, that goes something like this. A lot of times, and this was common in this day and age, uh, when animals would be put out to pasture at night, they would actually be brought into the house. Okay, think of your favorite dog or your favorite cat, and maybe they have way too much weight in your house, right? Uh, because they begin off the furniture and then they move onto the furniture, they begin in their own bed and they wind up in your bed. Uh, a lot of times people would bring their sheep or whatever into their actual homes at night and they would put the feeding trough in their homes. And so it could actually be that Joseph and Mary were in somebody's home with the animals at night when Jesus was born, which means they wouldn't have been receiving no hospitality. They would have been receiving incredibly gracious hospitality because even though the guest room was full, they were able to come and stay in their living room. Some of you will remember I, I shared an experience that Julie and I had in Ethiopia where we visited a, a rural family in a small village. And uh, when we went to their home, uh, we walked into this, into this sort of domed shape home and walked inside, and it's sort of a, a model of ancient homes. They've been building these homes the same way for a long time. And if you remember, I walked in, it was, we went from bright light to pitch black, walked into this house and stepped in something about the same time that something very large was moving next to me. <laughs> Well, I was in the stable, and uh, next to the stable was the kitchen. Behind the kitchen were the sleeping quarters, a little loft area uh, where the children were, and the lower area below where, where the parents were. And when I'm talking about above and below, I'm talking about the difference between here and there, and that's all the room there was. If we put ourselves in that situation, if Julie and I were Mary and Joseph and we desperately needed a place to be, these folks in their most generous, generous offering to us could have offered us a place in their home, but it would have been essentially a stable. And so I think we have to keep in mind the, the scale and the reality of the context. And uh, again, if you think about your ancestral home, you know where your great, great, great grandparents came from? If you go back there, some of you may be able to tap somebody on the shoulder and say, hey, can I stay with you? Most of us would be talking to strangers, right? And so I think that sort of brings all of that into context. Next question. This is a longer one. 
It is believed that there are between four and 10 billion planets just in our solar system alone that could sustain life. Expert, experts agree math, it is mathematically po- impossible that there are not other life forms, including intelligent life forms, in the universe. If we are not the only intelligent life form in the universe, what does that say about the validity of the Christian story that was written by earthly Christian figures and specifically for, earth, for an earthly audience? So, uh, first thing I want you to keep in mind, uh, between four and 10 billion planets um, in our solar system, I think in our galaxy or universe that could indeed sustain life. Um, that in and of itself is mind-blowing. Which means that uh, Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God was doing some serious, serious work when he created all of that. And uh, second of all, let's just say that there are other planets out there and they have other intelligent life forms on there. Uh, That says something, just the vastness of of our solar system and then the galaxy and then the universe as a whole says something very deep about God's love for you. Uh, For God to pick you, not only out of like, you know, a lot of history and a lot of people and all of that stuff, but out of something as vast as our universe, uh, that simply means that that God's love really is amazing. Does it mean that God doesn't love the rest of what he created? No, God loves all of what he's created. Scripture is very clear on that. And so is there anything inherently against there being other intelligent life forms on other planets? Uh, Scripture doesn't speak to that in one regard or another. But if the universe really is that vast, which it is, and if the possibility of other life forms on other planets really is a possibility, which it seems to be, that simply says something about God's love for us. And it doesn't undermine the witness. Because remember, uh, what was written in the Bible was not just written by by people who were trying to to grind an ax. Scripture is clear about this, like the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, These were written by eyewitnesses, by people who saw this with their own eyes and wanted to make sure that it was recorded for posterity. And uh, just because something happens on the earth doesn't mean it doesn't matter because the rest of the universe is so vast. It does, which is why we still record eyewitness testimony even to this day. One of the things I think about, one of the things that I think about when I, when I read this question is the reality of, of what you said. So God is speaking to us. He's speaking to this planet. He's speaking to the, to the creatures that he created on this planet. It doesn't preclude the fact that, that there are other places with other life forms, intelligent life forms with whom God has relationship, and that they have a story of their interaction, their relationship with God and the things that he's done in that context. In fact, think about it this way. We have a God who is capable of creating all of these planets, wouldn't it be a little boring if we were the only? I mean, imagine the, the, the ability of this God. It's beyond our wildest imagination. Wouldn't it be just a little bit boring to think that his, his whole energy and focus would be occupied just with us? Man, that sounds boring to me. I get a little tired of it just myself, right? So the reality is we have this amazing God who has the the ability to create and sustain whatever he chooses. So the possibility that there's life and that that life has a relationship and an interaction with God that is different than ours, that that doesn't trouble the Bible or Christianity whatsoever. In fact, it's outside the scope entirely of the things that the Bible teaches, but not outside the scope of possibility. Next question. Why did God spare the lives of the children of the why didn't God spare the lives of the children of the peoples conquered by the Israelites in the book of Joshua for instance? So this is a tough question. And uh, let's just begin here. There's no complete and total and full answer to this question. This is one of these things that God fully understands that we simply don't. So, let's just talk about a little bit of food for thought. Number one, um, when Abraham first goes to Canaan, uh, the year is about 2000 BC. When Joshua marches into Canaan, uh, it's about 1406 BC. And so you can do the math. We're talking over 600 years that God was actually waiting among the Canaanites, just, just letting everything skate along as it was. And make no mistake about it, what was going on in Canaan was terrible. And this actually leads me to the second thing. You know, archaeologists have actually uncovered mounds and mounds of clay pots, and inside the clay pots were the remains 
of, of, of little ones, because this was common in the ancient world. Sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices, and this was passed down from generation to generation to generation in the region of Canaan uh, for those who were actually fortunate enough, I suppose, to make it all the way to adulthood when they weren't part of these nasty rituals for these pagan gods. And so what God was doing in one sense, at least part of what he was doing, was he was putting a clean break after 600 years of being patient and saying this is not going to be repeated generationally. Now, part of the kind of pathetic thing about this, and we need to be honest about the history of the Israelites, is that the Israelites, they, they were happy to carry out a lot of these commands, except when it came to the kings. They would spare the people of power, which that's just so upside down in God's economy, which is why God takes the Israelites to task for that. One more thought on this. When it comes to the judgment of God, he's very persuadable. Just back up 600 years and remember a conversation that Abraham has with God over two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. God loves to be persuaded to grace. And sometimes I wonder if maybe Moses or Joshua wouldn't have taken that opportunity and said, hey, let's talk about this. If they would have found a real listening ear just like Abraham. Well, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point, Zach, because when we think about Jonah, for example, Jonah, Jonah hates the people of Nineveh. He wants them to die. He can't wait for God to, to bring down fire and destroy the peoples. And the th- reason he doesn't want to go to Nineveh is not only because he's not afraid, but what does he know about God? That God is merciful and slow to anger. And so he doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he's afraid if he preaches to them and their hearts are turned and they turn to God in repentance that God will show them mercy. And that's exactly what happens. And and Jonah is discouraged. He's heartbroken over this. And, And so the reality is we need to understand this whole thing as we try to frame it up in our minds. We need to understand this in the context of a God who doesn't delight in sacrifice or blood or violence. He's a God who delights in mercy. Next question. How does God forgive divorce? And I think probably where we need to start with is does God forgive divorce? Yes, he does. And he forgives it the same way he forgives any other sin by, by Jesus. There's this real famous verse in Malachi, maybe you've heard it before, uh, where God says these three words, and uh, maybe these have been used as a club against you once upon a time. I hate divorce. Now, now, when God says that, one of the questions we need to ask is, well, well, why? Why does God hate divorce? And there's this really interesting um, line in the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is struggling with Israel and all of her unfaithfulness, just like God is. And um, God is chasing after Israel and her faithlessness. And, and finally, God says, I gave faithless Israel, this is Jeremiah 3, a certificate of divorce, and I sent her away. Now, here's the reason this is so important. Um, If you want to know someone who knows the pain of divorce, who knows the sting of a wrecked and broken relationship, who knows all the complexities of it, who knows the hopelessness and the despair of it, God's been there. He's been betrayed. He's been hurt. And you know what? A relationship that God loved fell apart on him. There's why God says, I hate divorce, because he knows. He knows what it feels like, and he doesn't want that for you, which is why if your relationship is heading down a path right now where it could all fall apart, Don't wait until you're right on the cusp of everything blowing up. Start talking to someone now. Get the help you need now because God doesn't want that for you. And I think if you're real honest with yourself, you don't want that for you. Yeah, that's, again, great guidance. One of the the realities is that we get phone calls from people and they're in the midst of a crisis because their husband or their wife has said they're going to file for divorce. That's not when the crisis started. The crisis started long before that. 
And so the reality is, if, if you're struggling, if there's a problem, there's something going on, get help for it. Call. Uh, set an appointment. Talk to us about what's happening. And don't wait till it gets to be a crisis. Come and talk to us. We'll be glad to talk to you. And maybe we'll say to you, you know what? What you're going through is normal. Here's what we would suggest. Or, or you're already doing all the right things. But maybe we can help you or point you in the right direction or get you connected with a, with a counselor who will help save your marriage instead of doing triage on a relationship that's already gone. You know, the other thing that I think about in this question is, is the reality, yes, God hates divorce, but dear brothers and sisters, God hates sin. He, he hates gossip. He hates lying. He hates violent, angry thoughts that are equal to murder according to Scripture. So uh, how does God forgive all of that? Well, in exactly the same way that he forgives every sin in our life, through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we say that and we take it for granted. How does God forgive all of that? He forgives it by sending his son to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. He forgives all of those things that he hates in our lives and washes us clean because he loves us so much, he wants us back. He loves us so much, he's willing to send his son to die, to experience judgment in our place. That is the profound truth of the gospel. God forgives divorce, he forgives lying, he forgives murder, he forgives every sin at the horrible and expensive price of the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God, he does, because there is no other way for you and me. Next question. Why do you make the sign of the cross? I love how we, we have these deep theological issues, and then we have these very practical issues, yep. don't you? I mean, these are your questions, so it's awesome. Why do you make the sign of the cross at the beginning of the service, at baptism, and other times? What's the significance? So, here's the, here's the deal. Well, uh, first of all, yeah. do you have to do that? No. You don't have to do that. You don't that. have to do that. And this is actually one, one of the great things about this. This actually gets to the heart of so much of what happens in worship. What happens in worship is awesome, but it's not because we're making the sign of the cross and we're not making the sign of the cross. Right. It's not because we're singing this song or that song or bowing at this time or that time or reverencing. Uh, it's because Jesus is here and he is giving us his gifts. That's what makes worship awesome. So we have all these traditional worship practices, which basically are meant not to be awesome in and of themselves, but to point us to Jesus. And that's what right. the sign of the cross does. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, I claim to know nothing while I was among you, but Jesus Christ in him crucified. Uh, Martin Luther summarized Paul's statement like this when he said, the cross alone is our theology. What's Christian theology all about? It's all about the cross. It's all about Jesus' death. It's all about his resurrection. And so this is simply a reminder of that. You can never get enough of Jesus in the cross. Wait, wait, wait. did you touch your nose first and then? Yes. I thought you were supposed to touch your forehead first. Ah, so. <laughs> See, exactly. And then there are people who do it in slightly different ways. I just did it the wrong way. He did it the correct way. So, so take, <laughs> take, take notes. Thank you for noticing <laughs> that. You get the idea, right? It's not about making the sign of the cross or not. But here's one of the things that I love about making that sign of the cross at the beginning of the service. Notice it goes along with the invocation where we say that we worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And, and so we make that sign of the cross and it connects us, at least in theory, to another place where that, the, that name was spoken over us in our baptism. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so that, that, that physical action is simply just a, a mnemonic device that helps us remember that we are baptized into and we worship in the name of that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, at the end of the service, because it's Jubilee, we'll have the, the baptism and reaffirmation of baptism. And if you reaffirm your baptism, guess what sign I'm going to make with that water on your forehead? The sign of the cross. Does it have to be like that? Absolutely not. I could simply touch your forehead, or you could touch your forehead with that droplet of water. But the reality is, I make that sign of the cross just so in my own mind, and perhaps in your mind, it all connects back to the cross, where you and I were forgiven and set free, where God claimed us as his own. 
Okay, how are we doing on time? Let's do, let's do one more question. Right. Oh, and awesome. This is a question that, that came via online. So somebody who's watching the service this morning. If we are held blameless before God through Christ's death, why are we to be, ju- why are we to be judged? So explain blameless, first of all. Okay, so blameless uh, basically means there's no blame that can be assigned to you. Uh, all those sins that you've done, yeah, God doesn't blame you for those. Uh, all of those mistakes that you have made, God no longer holds you responsible for those. And, and here's the reason why. Let's just be real clear on this. In 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says, God made him, that'd be Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. Here's what Paul's getting at there. All of your sin, all of your mistakes, all of your transgressions, all of your iniquity, whatever words you want to put on it, all of your junk gets put on Jesus. And who Jesus is gets put on you you become righteous. And yet we have this thing called, called Judgment Day. And so why would we be judged? Well, here's the key. You're judged according to what Jesus has done for you, not according to what you have done as you. There's this great line in Revelation 20. Uh, it's one of my favorite sections of Scripture where uh, Revelation 20, verse 12, John has this vision, and he says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne of God. And then he says, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Now the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead and all who were in it. Death and hell gave up the dead and all who were in them. And they were all judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he perished. And so notice what John says. There are these books, right? And they have all the stuff we've done. All of them. So this is like, you know, bigger than the Encyclopedia uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Not that anyone has one of those anymore. But there are lots of books. And then there's one book, the book of life. And John says, what's in that book? Just your name. Because it's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus has done for you. And so John sets up this, this, this choice. Which one is it going to be for you? All the stuff in the books that you have done, are you going to be judged according to that? Or are you going to be judged according to the book that just has your name? Because it's not about what you've done. It's about Jesus. So a little practical example. Think of this as a hypothetical example. But let's say that, that one day, driving down 1604 and getting off at uh, the, the exit there for uh, military, right after military highway, let's just say that I got off on that exit ramp and I was exceeding the speed limit. Of course, it could never happen, but let's just say it did. And uh, let's just say that as I came over that little mound, there was a, a police officer doing radar. And let's just say, hypothetically, that he pulled <laughs> me over and gave me a ticket for speeding. And that there was a date to appear in court, and I appeared in court on that particular date, not knowing what was going to happen, expecting that I was going to... Uh, pay a fine or something. I wasn't expecting to be thrown in jail, hypothetically, right? And as I stood there, they read my court case and my name, and the judge said, case dismissed. And I really didn't know what was going on. And he said, just step over to the bailiff. No, by the way, you can thank officer so-and-so. And what had happened is that that officer had seen my name on the, on the list, had somehow done whatever he did, and because of his good name, I was excused. You realize that is the picture. You and I are dead to rights. We are sinners. We are broken. We are flawed. It's all true. And yet, when it comes to our being judged, the judgment is forgiven, righteous, not because of what we did, because of the good name and the precious blood of Jesus. That's what it means for those of us who trust in Christ to be believed. You know, as we, as we wrap this service up, I want to remind you that, uh, as I've said before, it's Jubilee Sunday. 
And so there's a mission opportunity out in the entryway, the care kits that we talked about before. That's a great way to love the people in our community and to care for those who are least among us and know that we're doing something and providing something that's constructive. By the way, it doesn't matter what they do with it. It's that we care enough to actually give them something that will be of help to them. But in addition to the, to the mission opportunity, we also have the opportunity for baptism. If you've never been baptized, but as you're thinking about all of this, you feel like the Holy Spirit's whispering in your ear, today's the day to be baptized, come on up here. Meet me up here. There's no, there's no fuss. There's no muss. Come up here. Tell me you want to be baptized, and I'll baptize you. Maybe you were baptized a long time ago. I want you to know something. That baptism, no matter how long ago it was, no matter how old you were, that one baptism lasts for a lifetime. That's when God claimed you to be his own. But you know, sometimes we go through things and we lose track. God doesn't change. His love for us doesn't change, but we lose track of God. And sometimes we want that reminder that says, you know what? What God promised way back when is still true today. We call that reaffirmation of baptism, where, where I touch your head with that water and it reminds you, you still and forever belong to Jesus. And if you want to reaffirm your baptism today, then come on up here. We'll do that and pray together as well. But right now, let's uh, close this service in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of this time together. Thank you, Lord, for a congregation that allows us to do something that's so out of the norm and I pray that you will use the, the answers and the, the conversation and hopefully the spirit of this discussion to bless the lives of those who hear as your spirit works through our feeble efforts. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. Happy New Year.